Welcome to the Bootstrap Founder. Today, I'm talking to Luis Pereira. He's the maker behind the audio transcription product AudioPen, which recently became very successful after many not so great attempts at building other businesses. Luis shares his insights into how he approached pricing and subscriptions to validate demand early on. And then he dives into the importance of building and launching products in public to grow an audience and gain early traction the true indie hacker way. And I use his product every week. It's really cool and the story of it is even cooler. Before we dive into our chat, a quick thank you to our sponsor, acquire.com. More on that later. Now here's Lewis. It rarely happens that an indie hacker makes it into TechCrunch with their product, but you did, and your your product, AudioPen, is seeing massive success at this point. And it looks like you came out of nowhere. It's really, really cool. Big congratulations on that. And before we dive into how you performed that miracle of getting into TechCrunch and having an amazing product that people really like, let me ask you this. How does it feel to hit it this big? Was it a surprise? Like, how do you how are you feeling right now? Um like feeling pretty good man <laughs> like i can't lie <laughs> um although like it's like I, I i would have expected it to have happened sooner like i've been at it for a while now it's not that it was my first swing and you know it was a hit um i've swung 10 to 15 times maybe more um and it was it was quite a difficult journey throughout um you know difficult in the sense like lacking monetary success um it was enjoyable for sure. And I think that's why I sort of managed to make these whatever 10, 15 swings until one finally, you know, struck whatever gold. Um, but it feels good. Like I know that it's, 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 it's rare because at least for me, it's rare because I've tried so many times and I've finally gotten one product that seems to be doing quite well. Um, unexpectedly that too. Um, so definitely feels, feels good, feels extremely grateful. Um, you know, that, that it happened. But like having said that, like I feel like, if you keep swinging, um, eventually, like you will hit six, right? Like if you, like if you got a dice and you just keep rolling it, it's got to hit six at some point. The, the, the game is to figure out what you, what dice you want to keep rolling. Um, and what dice can you keep rolling without getting bored? Yeah. I, I do wonder, cause I looked into your previous uh, projects. You, you do list them on, on your website and everything, which is really cool. You've tried a lot of different things, right? You've, you've went into, I think, niche list, uh, the blogging, micro blogging platform. You had a, like, read something cre- great. You had a curated articles, do nothing for a minute. That's one of my favorites. So I just, uh, encourage people to do nothing, but I feel like with this product in particular, you have found like what I would call product market fit. There's a real need for what you're currently providing with audio. Audio pen. So I I would like to to ask you about like, what do you do you see being different about this particular product, or maybe not even the product, but how you approached it that uh, resulted in a much much bigger kind of audience for and customer base of the product. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take credit for you know discovering this untapped need um, or finding product market fit through some sort of rigorous procedure of feedback and stuff because it. Like it wasn't, it wasn't very intentional. Um, I said this before. I think most people that follow me will know that I've said audio pen was quite an accident. Um, I was just building, I built about five tools that week on my own website, like tiny tools on my own website, um, without any intention of, you know, making them standalone tools or commercial tools. I wanted to just learn how to use open AI's APIs. Um, and I was trying to use them in a slightly more novel way rather than, you know, try and, um, you know, just use one API and, and go from A to B. I wanted to see what if I combined a couple, you know, do a couple of interesting things, see what happens. Um, and because I'd been in the space, it was a bunch of factors that came together. Like I'd been in the space building for a few years. Um, I had a relevant sort of Twitter audience, not very large, but quite relevant. Um, I had been building publicly for a while. Um, people had used my products before. Um, and while I was doing these experiments, I, I, I used to talk about them on Twitter. Right? Like I just, I just tweet about each one of these tiny tools that week. Um, and I managed to hit some sort of a chord with, with audio pen, um, that I didn't expect. Like I got a lot of sudden positive feedback from people in my Mm -hmm. DMS and not, not too much of it, but enough of it to make me sort of think twice because I personally am not a, I'm not an audio, you know, note sort of person. I don't take voice notes very often. Now I do, but before that I didn't. Um, so I was like, okay, a, a bit taken aback as to like, this seems to have hit some sort of a, a chord with people, struck some sort of a chord with people. Um, like maybe I should just sort of zoom in and see if if I can build something out of this. Um, so I mean, 
I don't want to I don't want to seem like I'm some sort of Steve Jobs that you know figure out what the customer wants without the customer knowing it. Um, I stumbled upon it, um, but I had been playing the game long enough um, that you know it, it worked in my favor. Stumbled upon it, but it was a function of taking so many swings that you know I got lucky um, in one of them. Um, so yeah, product market fit for me was if if I've reached it, um, and maybe I have, I don't know. Um, if I've reached it, it's not it's not for my genius or anything. It's it's pure um, just a function of of playing multiple rounds and hitting one. Yeah, that that does make sense. It's a it's a nice and humble perspective on being at the right place at the right time with the right not just idea but also with the willingness to just execute it to see if it sticks. Right? That does a that's a big difference because everybody has cool ideas, but building it, even if it's just a prototype, that is too much for most. So just having that and other things that didn't work and seeing what the market resonates with is an interesting approach. It is a scattershot approach, though, right? It's kind of you you yeah. try all these things and you see what sticks. That tends to waste a lot of energy and time. And But but since you did it, the time uh, that you invested in the other things is not wasted. It's just, you know, it's, it's now being hopefully pulled into the product that is actually working out, the bet that is uh, is going well. So tell me more about like how well AudioPen actually is doing, if you're willing to di- divulge these numbers. How many uh, customers or users do you currently have with that product? At the moment, um, in terms of registered users, about 30,000, um, including free Okay, but yeah, it's, it sounds like to me, I've been thinking a, a little bit about this. Being a user of the product, I obviously wanted to keep succeeding and sticking around, right? That's that's kind of my interest as well. And I've been thinking at it from a developer perspective, from a business owner's perspective too. And I was I was wondering like how you deal with with platform risk because there is obviously risk in building features and building the wrong features or going onto native platforms and building this and that and whatnot. That that's one feature set or one kind of risk set, I guess, that you have to think about. But the other side is the actual platform that you're building on, which is OpenAI's API. How are you uh, protecting your your business or your product from you know, depending too heavily on that particular API and those the, the platform underneath it? See, at the moment, I'm trying to get like backups for it. Um, so, for instance, for instead of Whisper, which is the voice model, I also have a couple of others that I've got access to, um, DeepGram, Assembly, etc. Um, they're not as good in they're, they're they're as good in certain respects, but not in in others. Um, as a package, I think OpenAI is still the best. Uh, but I do have those backups if you know things change. Um, as far as like GPT four is concerned, I'm like I still don't have a very strong backup. I have. I have like I'm on the wait list for Claude, uh, hoping to get that soon. Um, I don't think any others come close um, to GPT four yet. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gets sorted. I mean, fingers crossed. Until then, worst case scenario, I'll just get like another person's API access or something for a bit. If, <laughs> uh, but I mean, so far I haven't heard of any cases where you know folks have had their API keys revoked or whatever. Um, yeah, well, that's that's kind of. Um... I'm I'm really hoping for these these models to be able to be used on the edge, like on on our own self-hosted systems. Eventually, I mean that, that is always going to be more expensive, I guess, than just you know accessing the mm-hmm. API. But to be able to run a GPT four model somewhere, right, in, yeah. in your own on your own data center, on your own Kubernetes cluster, or whatever, that would be really cool. A Whisper is an is an example of this. I use Whisper yeah. for my own podcast for this very podcast. In fact, I I use it to get like a preliminary transcript from which then I generate. Um, potential, you know, like uh, descriptions for the video or tags for the video, all of this stuff comes from Whisper that I run over the the actual, you know, the final video file of this. So, and that is local. That is just a local uh, installation of that AI, if you can call it, right, which is just a a machine learned um, system there. So this being available is really cool. And having that as a backup option is is an interesting idea. How much of your time do you spend on a front end or you know like feature work compared to making the the business more stable or more resilient against platform risk? You know what's what's the split there right now for you? It depends from week to week, man. Like I'm okay. I'm a solo builder with no team. So like for instance, this week has been terrible because I wanted to build a bunch of features. Uh, a couple of days ago, I just like found out that. Like audio pen had been like blacklisted from a couple of um by a couple of like antivirus sites 
um, just because there was like a surge in traffic from a couple of countries in the Middle East. That was very unexpected for me. So I don't know what sort of traffic it was. Uh, but I spent the past couple of days just like reaching out to these people and, um, you know, creating false positive um, reports. And they've just been like, oh, sorry, you know, our bad. <laughs> like, here you go. It, it's clean now. Uh, but like I've spent the better half, better part of like, what, 48 hours just frantically responding and trying to clear this thing out. Like it's almost done now for no fault of mine. Like I can't, like I didn't do anything wrong. Um, it just happened. Um, so like on a week to be week basis, like if there's no crisis to handle, um, I, I would prefer spending my time building features because that's what I genuinely enjoy doing. Um, of course, sometimes I have to force myself to sort of create content as well um, about those features. Like I've learned the hard way that, if you build too many features and customers don't know that the features exist, um, it's pointless having built those features. Um, so I've spent some time sort of creating videos, um, you know, text content, FAQs, et cetera, et cetera, some tweets maybe, um, so that people can sort of get educated about what I've, what I've built for them. Um, but yeah, otherwise if I have the time and if you left me alone, I would, I would just, I would just build, like I would build from morning to night. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the the indie hacker life, right? If you could just like wake up, build cool stuff, go to bed yeah. and repeat. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. How much cust- how much customer service do you have? How much conversations or how many conversations do you have with uh with customers or prospective customers right now? Uh, mostly with customers. Um so I I don't have a chatbot on the website. Um mm-hmm. I almost actually stumbled upon this idea as well and it it worked out quite well for me where when I launched the MVP, I think soon after or maybe on that day itself. Um, I didn't have the time to sort of figure out what chatbot to kind of add to the site and, and stuff. So I just created like a simple little message box um, with a button. Um, and when somebody sends me in a message, it comes to me as an email along with that person's uh, email ID that they've registered with. So you need to be logged in in order to to chat with me or not to chat, but look, to email me. Um, and that's been great. Like I don't, I'm not expected to reply instantaneously. Um, I get better responses from people. Like I get better feedback um, longer rather than just a high or, you know, one or two lines. Yeah. Um, it's not front and center on the app. It's not like, you know, on the first page, you need to click on the account tab and then you see it. So it's only people that have reached a particular threshold that they feel like, okay, I need to contact this guy um, that contact me. Um, and of course, besides that, people reply to all of the emails I send them as well. So on a weekly basis, I send emails to, to the users. Um, I get a bunch of replies. Um, on average, I would say I reply to maybe 20 people a day, 20, 25 people a day. Um, and that goes up and down depending on, you know, if I've sent out an email today, um, then that number might become, you know, a hundred, um, for a day or two. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, 20, 25. How many of these are uh, feature requests over actual like bug reports? Um, 50, 50, I'd say, um, That's mostly, cool. yeah, like, because so the feature requests always come from from prime users because they've got access to the entire feature set um and then they you know know what they want so that's it's it's sort of limited if if everybody had access to everything i'd probably get more um and bug requests usually come from like the free users because they aren't like sure exactly how to use certain things or you know some things at scale of course you end up getting uh, more bugs than than what the prime users um experience uh, but so far, like, yeah, so far there haven't been any like crazy bugs. Um, a bunch of minor ones at the start that I I think I've sorted out and a couple of like recurring ones that I know I can't sort out until I sort of go native. Um, those aren't bugs. Those are actually just just features that people think are bugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That's, a, that's also a product education thing, right? Where you have to just teach people how to use the product, right? Uh, that's that's always that, an issue. That, that's I, actually I, an interesting, that's an interesting thing to think about. Like I, I, I spent the last week trying to think about what sort of content to create for people. Um, and then, you know, I went, I went on this tangent of thinking, maybe I should create a, you know, page of like how to's, um, you know, and tell people how to do different things on the app, like how to, let's say, change your writing style, how to download a note, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I almost got started on it. Um, and then I was like, you know, if I do this, uh, it's going to encourage me to create a less intuitive app. Um, then I start, depending on this page to teach users what to do. Um, that should not be the case. I should be reworking the app to make it intuitive enough for people not to need this page in the first place. Uh, maybe, of course, I you know I can build it at, at a later date when you know, I have a lot of users and they don't have time or whatever. But like at this early in the product, like I should not be needing that page. I should suffer if my product is not 
intuitive enough um, and I should maybe talk to customers directly to explain it to them. So at least I have some sort of interaction with them to understand what they don't understand. Um, so I've held off from that for now. That's great. That, that is a wonderful perspective. Thanks for sharing it so eloquently. I think the idea of having a usable product is so much stronger than having a, a good documentation for an unusable product, right? Okay, obviously, it, it is, it's just, uh, you know, one level further down the complexity hatch, right? Doing, you don't want the things to be so complex that you need documentation. I, I agree with this. I think that the problem there is usually that the moment you change UI, somebody gets upset. Right, either somebody who's already used to the old stuff, or somebody who wants it differently. Like everybody will get upset about something at some point, which is um, it's not a solution for the for the documentation usability problem. But you the, people tend to yeah not want their UI to change once they're used to it, which is I think why most founders add documentation rather than making big changes in the interface. But I guess you're at a stage where that is still yeah, it's, completely it's still flexible, too early. Right? I think I might have made yeah. one or two big changes um, in terms of like moving buttons around and stuff. Uh, but so far, like I've not received, like I've received maybe a couple of, of complaints about it being like, hey, I can't find this. Uh, but but I'm guessing the others have, have figured it out. Yeah, I guess, guess they must have. One thing that, that really interests me is the 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 subscription level that you have the prime users right you you have paying customers which is great for any any indie hacker that actually makes money off their product that is already quite the accomplishment when did you integrate uh, the subscription level was it there from the start or did you add it at a later point so i so i actually built the first version of the product during a hackathon that i organize once every two months um called half day build um and the goal of that hackathon was uh, is rather to go from idea to revenue within 12 hours. Um, so I was forced to have, um, you know, a, a payment link on the website the day it went live, like the minute it went live. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I built it on on that, uh, on that during that hackathon. And, and it was, in fact, I had invited a bunch of beta users from Twitter or I had just tweeted out saying, hey, you know, I'm, this product seems like it's ready to launch. Um, does anyone want to be a beta tester? So I got like, you know, 10, 15 people that were like, yeah, yeah I'll do it. Um, so I gave them access um, and a few of them bought it. Like it wasn't even live yet. Um, a few of them bought it. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to, there's something here. Like I got to double down on this um, and keep making it better. That's cool. Yeah, that, great. Great way to start. I think uh, a big lesson here, <laughs> put put a, a payment link into even the first prototype of your project if you want to see if people find it even valuable enough at that point, right? Pay for it. Uh, pricing. How did you deal with pricing? How did you set the prices? And I, you, you earlier said that you you started a bit too cheap and you made it more expensive. Tell, tell me more about the pricing journey of AudioPen. Cool. So, so I, like, I like keeping things extremely simple. Um, when I started off, I, I wanted to, like, I want, I thought I'd do like a whole subscription, you know, monthly thing um, and stuff. Um, and then I was just, I was, I think I just ran out of time to like build a whole subscription thing during that 12 hour uh, hackathon. So I said, let me just do a lifetime deal for early users. Um, and I priced it like dirt cheap. It was like $19 for lifetime um, with mm -hmm. like GPT-4 access and stuff or whatever yeah. like, I, I would pay for. At, at that time, maybe it was GPT-3.5. I don't remember. Um so it was, it was very cheap, but I was basically validating demand. Um, and I know people have this, like, there's this whole debate of like, should you have a lifetime deal if you have recurring costs? Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about it um, because of course, like I have recurring costs, right? Like every time somebody uses the product, um, I pay a small amount. Um, and my solution to that was twofold. One is as I increase the number of features in a product or increase the amount of, of ways that a person can use or wants to use this product in. Um, if I have a lifetime deal, I keep increasing the price of that lifetime deal. Um, so for context, the lifetime deal that once was $19 um, at the start is now $150. Um, and people are still buying it because I've increased the number of features that I offered as compared to what it was uh, at launch. Uh, and the second thing I do is I include an annual deal as well um, and I play with the pricing, with the pricing ratio of the two um, until I get a split that I'm happy with that is sustainable. Um, so for instance, right now, the annual pricing is is at $75 and the lifetime deal is at $150. Um, and I'm happy with the split, the number of people picking this over that or that over this. Um, so 
I want it to be sustainable. Like at any point of time, I need to be able to service people uh, at least morally. If you're paying for a lifetime deal that is worth twice as much as an annual deal, I need to be able to assure you that I will give you at least two years, if not more at any point of time. If you buy it today, I have to guarantee you two years or not. I mean, I'm not explicitly guaranteeing it to people, um, but like morally, I feel that responsibility. Um, so I make sure that that ratio is correct for my cost to sort of um, be sustainable. Um, and of course, I'll, I'll probably end the lifetime deal soon in a couple of months. Um, but until then, I think it's a great way to get like early supporters on board, um, get people who, once they've bought a lifetime deal for your product, become like vocal advocates of it because they feel like they're part of the journey. They're not just here for a month or a year or whatever. They're here for life. Um, they want to see the product get better. So they give you better feedback. Um, they want other people to know that, hey, you know, I was an early believer in this product and I'm part of its journey. Um, they tell other people about it. So it's it's got a lot of benefits that um, that I think are worth considering, um, even if you have recurring costs. Yeah. Yeah, great idea. I think that the lifetime deal subsidizes the the first, you know, the first uh, couple months and years of of building this business, where you need to you still uh, you have to pay you have to pay your expenses, right? And it has to come from somewhere. And you have to be able to invest into it. And at a certain point, you kind of have to either really increase the price, as you said, to make it still valuable, or just turn off the lifetime stuff. Not not turn it off for people who have it, but turn it off for new potential customers. New people, I yeah. do wonder what does lifetime mean to you? Because I think there's like three or four different lifetimes that we could talk about. Your lifetime, your product's yeah, lifetime, no, your business's no. so, so lifetime, you, your customer's <laughs> lifetime. Which one? Which one if, is it if, for you? If you if you if you try to buy a lifetime deal on audio pen, I've very explicitly written in multiple places that you will have access to the product for as long as the product is alive. Um, I don't know how long I'll be around. Maybe I'm here for a hundred years. I don't know if the product will be around <laughs> for a hundred years. I have no clue. Maybe you'll be around for a hundred years. I, I can't guarantee you to be there for a hundred years. If it is great, like you'll have access throughout. Um, if it isn't, then like, you know, it isn't. Um, but yeah, I've made, made sure that that's front and center. Lifetime is a lifetime of the product. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah, I mean, that's important. I, yeah. Yeah. Good job. I think you, you have, I think a lot of people who run lifetime deals are not that specific and that leads to a lot of problems, right? Lifetime, it could also just be of that version of the product. And I've seen this uh, a lot recently in the, what was it like video and audio uh, tools that, you know, like Fulmora was one of them. They had a lifetime deal and for one version up to like version 12 or 14 and they released version 15 and wouldn't honor lifetime anymore. And there was this whole outcry in the community for a pretty established product, right? It's it's a competitor to the Da Vinci or Premiere Adobe product. So you you have a sizable community and they were not happy like there was this whole youtube mm -hmm. outrage about this and you don't want to be on the receiving end of this for as a business particularly not as an indie hacker so being very clear with this that's that's great i'm, I'm really happy you made this very very clear from the start for a lifetime yeah job. i mean I, like, the way i think about it like not only for this decision but like for anything i decide with the product whatever it may be um I really like doing this stuff, right? Like I really like building, like I've done a lot of stuff. Like I've experimented, you know, I've played around, I've done, you know, a few things in life. And I found this one thing that I really like doing. Like I like building stuff, and, you know, like showing it to the world, sharing it to the world on the internet. Um, if given a choice, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, now, if I want to do this for the rest of my life, I cannot afford to lose people's trust. Like I cannot yes. have them say, Hey, this guy is a cheat. Right. Like I, that's the last thing. Then I, if that happens, I stop being able to do the one thing that I really like to do. Um, so like priority above whatever else, you know, money, whatever is just customer trust. Um, because I like, I, like I lose, if I lose trust, it's not only that, you know, I can run away with the money tomorrow. Like, what will I do then? Like, I'm going to do things I don't enjoy. That's stupid. Why would I want to do that? Um, so that's like, that's the lens I look at all of this stuff from. So yeah, I mean, just worth thinking. That makes me. Makes me so happy to hear this. Like this is such a such a kind of empowerment focused perspective. I mean, also, it's it's selfish in the best way. You want to do the thing you love, so you will not risk like uh, cheating people, or you won't cheat people just to just to get something short term. You want to do this long term. It's a it's the infinite game theory, right? You want to yeah. play the infinite game of indie hacking instead of just getting short term I mean, it's, it's, wins. it's very it's very difficult like i've like i i know this because like i've tried a bunch of things in life right like i've tried different types of, of products different types of experiments etc um, and it's not very easy like i have friends and you know family etc who haven't yet they're still trying they still haven't found the one thing they like to do so i know it's not easy to to stumble upon the thing that you want to do 
um, or to even have the opportunity to try and find it. Um, and like, yeah, I'm, I'm 30 years old, you know, I've spent whatever the past, let's say 10 years of my career um, trying different things. And now I found something maybe, you know, a, a year ago or so I found or two years ago, I found something that I really liked doing. Um, the very fact that I was able to do it for two, two and a half years without any, you know, major like win or any major income is because I like doing it. Like if, if audio pen didn't work, I would still be building things online. I would still yes. just be building random shit and sharing it. Like, because that's what I want to do. Yeah. Like, I don't want to not yeah. be doing that because it's not paying me. Like the fact that it's paying me is like the cherry on the cake. I'm like, great. I'm making money from it. Amazing. But if I wasn't, I'd still be playing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be building. It doesn't have to be, you know, writing. It can be anything it, like whatever you like to do. If you find out that you like to do it and you really enjoy it, um, you should do everything in your power to make sure that you can keep doing that till the day. Yeah. Day. yeah. And that's, and that's where community comes in, right? Because the community is the place where you find prospective customers, where you find peers that help you with your business decisions or with your design decisions or your UX decisions. That's where other people come in. And that, that's the thing why, why I really, really applaud your choice to put tr trust over anything else, over money, over fame, over wealth, whatever. Because if the trust does not exist, the community does not exist for you. You're an unknown, yep. untrustable entity in the community and you're doing the opposite. You're building in public. You're sharing everything you do. You're very, very open. Like the, this, this conversation is an example of this. You talk about the things that you enjoy and how much you enjoy them. And it's really noticeable. I'm, I'm really happy that you're doing this. Building in public has this been something that you've, that you've done for a long time or have you only recently found this to be something useful for your business building efforts? Mm, I think for as long as I've been building on the internet, I've built in public, um, mostly influenced by by KP. I'm um, sure you know him. Um, oh, yeah. I had actually, so I think back in 2020, during the pandemic, I had uh, just stumbled upon Twitter, I think, and, you know, see, like seen a couple of things there. And I was like, this was, this was a, a couple of years after I had moved back home from the city. Um, so I, I now live in a town called Goa. Um, it's a small state in India. Um, and I had moved from Delhi, which is where I studied and worked for a bit. Um, so I had seen like my social circle sort of shrinking. Um, at least I'd seen the interestingness of the conversations I was having also sort of drop because most of my friends are, you know, all over the place in the cities uh, of the country and the world. Um, and I had found Twitter as this like one new outlet that was, oh, interesting. People are talking about interesting stuff here. That's nice. Um, and then I decided in, in 2020, I, I not decided, but I, I thought to myself, okay, let's, let's try and do something on the internet. Uh, because the offline world, I, I, like I work with my family business during the day in the offline world, and I I enjoy building things there, but it's it's very high friction, right? Like it's um, everything requires permissions and you know investments, and it's it's complicated. You can't go from idea to revenue in twelve hours like you can on the internet. Um, so I decided in twenty twenty, okay, let me try and do something online, um, and I decided to start with like writing uh, because that seemed like the right or the easiest way to to you know enter. Um, I had some moderate success, et cetera. But then I realized very quickly that, hey, uh, you know, this never gets easier. Like you can have a thousand subscribers. You can have 10,000 subscribers. It doesn't matter. Like you still have to write for 20 hours a week yep. um, to yep. put out a good post. Um, and it's still hard. Like every time, no matter how much of an established writer you are, you will still want to tear your head out, tear your hair out yep. um, every time sure. you want to write a post. That's it's right. horrible. Um, <laughs> it's good after you've done it. You know, after you've published yeah. something, you feel good. But the process is is pretty grueling. Um, and I learned that the hard way and I, you know, I figured that that just wasn't sustainable for me because, um, although I enjoyed, you know, becoming, you know, a writer and creating stuff online, I have a full-time job. Like I don't have 20 hours a week, every week that I can sit and suffer through. So then the next best thing was to, to start building, uh, coming back to my first point, which is why I then joined the on deck. Uh, they had a, a, a no code fellowship, which KP was heading back in, I think 2021, um, I was a part of their first cohort and it, it gave me like this nice entry point into the indie hacking or the, the world of, you know, people building things, um, online, um, and sharing them as well. So that ethos of just, just sharing things online initially to not much response, uh, kind of was born there. But the fact that I had that community around me to make sure that, Hey, I would at least get some response. It's not that I was tweeting into the void, right? Like I, like three of my friends from my focus group would, would like my tweet or like share it or something. So it was nice. Uh, got started um, and then enjoyed the process of just building and like building in public. Like I, I don't take it to, like, I don't, I don't, I, 
I don't know what the word is, but like, I don't try to make it very performative, right? Like I just say what I'm doing. Like if I'm building something, I'll just say that I'm building this and like, Hey, here's what I'm doing. Like, here's how I'm doing it. Here's my rationale behind, let's say this decision or that's that decision. Um, and like, yeah, like most of my tweets are just like tweeting off the cuff or like a small screen recording with a, some text that's just off the cuff. Um, but yeah, I, I try not to make it like another chore. It's just like, it's like an update. It's like a, it's like a stream of consciousness sort of update. Um, and it seems to work. Like people seem to like it so far. Yeah, it's, it's great that you already had a couple of people to interact with around this. That makes it so much easier too. Right, a, a cohort of anything, like be it the the on deck fellowship or you know another little community, just of people that are all building at the same time. Right, people who are just sharing their work in progress kind of stuff. That makes such a big difference. And th- I love your non performative approach to what is always kind of a performance, you know, because it is a thing you act out in public. Right, you write about a thing. Like if you if you just were building and not talking about it to any. Anybody, you would never think about sharing this particular step. So there is this kind of conscious choice about it, this in- intentionality, but it's still not an act. You're not you're not changing anything. You're just sharing the reality of it, which is what building in public is. I'm really happy you're doing this. You're a great example of this with the product that you're building, the products that you have been building. I'm uh, really, really happy to see you do this. And, and the, the consequence is you meet a lot of cool people, right? You get a lot of opportunities just from sharing those stories. Is there, is yeah, there any I- particular story about building in public that you want to share that it was was really interesting to you? I, mean, I don't know if I have a particular story off the top of my head, but like I think in general, like the kind of people that you know I've interacted with through Twitter, like you, for example, like, like yeah, actually one story, like man, product hunt that launch for Audio Pen like, yes. blew my mind. Like I don't know yeah, what was great. happening there. Like I was like, what the hell? Like I don't know why it happened. Uh, I think a function of it might have been that. You know, I had been around for long enough that people sort of recognized my my you know profile picture. Maybe they sort of knew, okay, this guy is around, he's building stuff. Maybe some people, I don't know, man, maybe they're just nice human beings. Maybe some people just liked the product. Maybe they just felt good on that day. I don't know what it was. Um, I had no, like I had expectations um, of, let's say, three, 400 upvotes. That was my goal um, for that day. And it crossed <laughs> a thousand because like you yeah. shared it, a bunch of other big accounts shared it. And I was just like, what the hell is happening here? Like, this is mad. Yeah. Uh, because like, <laughs> you don't expect that kind of stuff, right? Like you go into this stuff as like a solo guy saying like, okay, I'm going to give it my best. I'm up against like funded teams that are putting out their products and l- let's see what happens. You know, like worst case scenario, I'll get some traffic on the website. Maybe a few people will buy my product and whatever, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, that was definitely like a, a big big moment um i i don't i don't know what how to express it but like it was a a very big like it's something i'll never forget um the fact that people i did not know um people that just saw my stuff on twitter not only like upvoted it but like shared it like wrote stuff about it um commented on the product hunt page uh, like to that volume with that much like love um like yeah it was it was wild like very very grateful that launch was so cool. I, I remember it too. And it's not even my product. It was so cool. It was, because, you know, that's the thing. Like we have this established relationship. And I think that's how many people feel who follow you on Twitter. They see you succeed and they are invested in you. And a little bit of your success kind of comes back to them because they know they've been pushing, they've been helping, they've been supporting you wherever they, whenever you need a like or a retweet or, or just input, right? They were there and I was there too. And I, I saw you, uh, saw that being launched and I saw, wow, product of the day. And then second for, like, like uh, of the week and fourth yeah. of the month like dude you just exploded yeah. there that was, that was so mad. cool yeah, yeah it's that's crazy, crazy. i uh, was going to ask you if you had any cool strategy but apparently the strategy is to just make friends with a lot of people and build cool yeah, stuff I right mean, so so i did like i did prepare for the launch in the sense like you know i created a nice page i spent a lot of time on the copy for it um you know i spent a lot of time creating like images and stuff i don't know if that helped uh, maybe it did like i i definitely gave it my best before I like launched. Um, I spoke to Chris Messina, like he had a conversation with me. He gave me like a few strategies here and there, uh, which I think like, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I've shared them on Twitter somewhere. Um, So I had prepared for it as best I could. Um, But like in no way did I anticipate like that what happened would happen. Like I thought, okay, best case scenario, maybe, you know, four or 500 votes, Um, not, not what, what happened. Um, But yeah, I, I think it's a function of just being like, I don't think that would have happened if I had just, joined Twitter that day and said, Hey guys, there's this cool product. Um, it wasn't about the product. It was 
about the product that people liked and had seen being built for a month and a half. Um, some of them had used it um, and they had maybe seen me around it. That I can't say. But um, yes. Yeah. That, 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 that is very grateful. Yeah, 100% my my impression of Product Hunt too. Product Hunt is not a product display case. It's an audience amplification machine, right? Yeah. If you have an audience already, they will come and upvote. And I think like India plays a big role there too. I remember both of my launches of the books, and I don't think they even launched books of Product Hunt, but I, I had a strong enough audience so that my stuff made it there and was not immediately banned, which is really cool. And I think the biggest push that I always had was from my 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 friends in India, because they are the ones that are awake the most the when it's mm-hmm. when it's midnight PM on, on the West Coast in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're the first ones. And if if my Indian people, my Indian friends, if they start start upvoting you shoot up and india is such yeah. a pivotal thing like it's most people don't seem to <laughs> understand how important india is for product hunt because they, they yeah, are the for the us it's at like that. 12 noon yeah it's like 12 yeah. 30 or something in the afternoon that, that's exactly live. right yeah. it makes a big difference yeah. that, that's something that most people don't really seem to understand because they like wake up at nine in the morning and then they start like or eight or six or whatever and then they activate their existing audience but that is already six if not uh you know four or five hours depending where you live in the states if you do it um into the day where a lot of people had a lot of opportunity to upvote already so yeah that's really cool that's important yeah product hunts an interesting space though i i I still don't think it's a good place to launch a brand new product i think it's a good place to find more customers once you have a product that you know works like once you have a product that has a monetization model, has a set of like co-users that like it, um, and then you go there and amplify it. It's not it's not a place to launch a brand new. No, product. it's it, and that's it's called it's called product hunt. It's not prototype hunt or idea hunt or you know like a yeah. business idea. Maybe let's see where this goes. Hunt. I mean, it's it's yeah. really for for things that are established and valuable enough for people to immediately use that are not buggy that are that are bug free hopefully or at least all that have social. Um, proof already around them, right? Product Hunt itself is social proof, but on Product Hunt, you also need social proof to get anywhere up in the list. So you're, you're absolutely right. It's an advanced late stage launch thing. I learned that the hard way as well. Like this was my second <laughs> launch. The, the previous product I launched, um, which was Read Something Great. Um, I, I launched it on Twitter on like a Monday. And like, I think in like 24 hours, somebody DM me saying, hey, I, I've hunted your product. On product hunt, and I was like, okay, cool. Like, I don't know what that is, but like, go for it, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what happens. Um, and a few <laughs> friends were like, dude, don't do it. You know, wait till the products like whatever uh, more mature. But I was like, hey, like, you know, let it be. This guy seems legit. Um, let's just do it. It did all right. It it finished at like number four um, after a lot of hustling. But it was like 24 hours old or something, like 48 hours maybe. Um, but then, like from then, I was like, okay, this is not a place to like. I didn't have a monetization model or anything. It was just a bunch of traffic that came and then went. Um, so yeah, I learned, I learned then that like, okay, don't do this again. Um, do it when you, when you have a more settled product. There are also certain things that, that won't perform on product hunt that are so niche, so specific to one particular group of people that getting the full attention of the tech community, which is, I guess, who goes to product hunt. That's, that's just a, a lot of attention that doesn't really resonate with the product. You see this a lot. A lot of, if you just scroll down, if you don't look at the top 10, but if you look at the bottom 500 that get launched every day, most of these are really cool products just for a really small group of people. That is not necessarily the audience that goes to product hunt, right? And that's also a thing. Like you, you, you have to go where your audience is to launch the thing. And you do this so well on Twitter. Um, uh, how did you launch AudioPen? Did you just kind of, just throw it out there and see what happens like after your hackathon or was it more of an elaborate launch on Twitter for you? So, so I was building those, those tiny tools on my website the week before the hackathon. Um, and like every day or so I would launch one of them and the launch would be like just basically a tweet saying, Hey, I built this thing. You can do this thing with it. Um, go check it out. Um, so audio pens initial launch, like the one that still lives on my website, which if you go to lewisparera.xyz, you can still find, um, was just a link with like, I, I think maybe a couple of lines of, of what it does. Um, and then after that, it, the, the hackathon was about five days later. Um, so I kept that hype up where I kept tweeting about like, hey, okay, I'm going to be building this for half day build, which is the hackathon. Um, and then like a day before the hackathon, I kind of tweeted out a few uh, Figma files that I had created um, with like preliminary designs um, saying, hey, this is what it's going to look like. I spent some time thinking, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then on the day of the hackathon, of course, um, it helped me because the community of people that were building alongside me, like as part of this hackathon, like all of us amplify each other's work. 
Um, so like that that's the purpose of the hackathon it's like give you this this short term community that comes together for a day or half a day um and just like boost each other to build something in public and try and go to revenue if you don't go to revenue it's fine but you got to try um everyone sort of amplifies each other's um, tweets or, or whatever um so that happened as well right i had that community i had a bunch of people that had already sort of followed me on twitter um prior to 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 audio pen um and i had been building a little bit of whatever hype or anticipation or whatever you want to call it um and then yeah and then then on the day of the hackathon um typically what i tell participants is create like a, a running twitter thread of your progress so like announce your product in tweet one um and then as you're building it tweet about your progress where you've reached what you're doing why you're doing it um how long it's going to take you how much time you have left you know like ask people if they want to be your your beta testers within that thread maybe retweet a partic- like a particular tweet and ask people if they would pay for it etc cetera, etc cetera. um so that kind of builds its own hype uh, because every few hours you have like an update coming up um and yeah i mean that's that's basically what i did for for audio pens <laughs> launch awesome how often do you run these hackathons do you still run them is that still happening yep yep every two months um i think the next one is on this either the 17th or the 9th of september if you go to halfdaybuild.com um you you'll see it um i can i can check later but yeah i'm going to put a link in the, in the show notes Th- this yeah. episode should it's, be out way before that so you know you yeah know, it's not a, it's not a very people. like formal hackathon it's just literally a discord um yeah 17th september is when the next one is um it's literally a temporary discord that i create like 3 or 4 days before the hackathon um with a few like resources um you know place for people to interact etc um on the day people just help each other either in discord help each other on twitter by by sharing the link uh, sharing each other's tweets um and then two or three days after the hackathon i delete the discord um so people don't have like discord bloat um they just it feels like a sprint they come in they make friends they build um and then they leave and if they want to keep friends you know they can follow each other on 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 twitter or whatever that's cool like indie hacker speed dating That's awesome. Yeah, pretty <laughs> I love much. That. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. And and to to think that such a um revenue generating and attention generating uh, product came out of it, huh? Isn't isn't that awesome? What a what a glorious example of what can come yeah, out of I mean, just I, meeting I've with been, a couple of people. I've been doing it for what? I don't know, over a year now, two years maybe. Um every initially it used to be every month. Um then I switched it to every two months because like it just got too hectic. Um But yeah, like most of the products I built during these half day builds have like all of them have died. Not maybe there's one that survived. <laughs> like all of the others have died. Um but yeah, I mean you you got to enjoy the process of swinging, right? Like it's it shouldn't feel like hard work. Like you know people say grind 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 and you'll finally make it. But like that's not the point because then even if you make it, you're still going to be grinding on the thing that you were grinding on, which you and by definition it means that you don't enjoy it. You're grinding because you don't enjoy it. So you yeah, shouldn't friction, be wanting right? to grind. Yeah, you shouldn't be wanting to do that. You should want something that's smooth, like something that you enjoy doing effortlessly. Um Oh, uh, that that you know what that reminds me of? You you recently tweeted about productivity porn. That was something that you were talking yeah. about because you know P- Peter Levels posted this uh picture of all these um books, like these self-help books, these f- books that founders would read to learn how to be more productive and and you thought about it and you um do you just want to say what what you were thinking and and maybe the discussion around that 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 came out of it? Yeah. Um yeah, so for context, I mean, there was a there was a, a picture of, you know, a very aesthetic picture with a bunch of books that were all white in color for some reason, um most of which were self-help books. Um and the context that was shared by by the person who tweeted it out was that, you know, you don't need to be reading um if you you know you just go and do stuff like you should just go and build um and i agreed with that on on first glance i was like yeah like a lot of these books are you know just they should have been a blog post um but there were a couple of reasons why i later sort of went back on my own um thoughts um and thought that maybe i was wrong with that that initial thought um one was that i i believe in this concept of of what i call bridge books okay so it's very easy for a person who's who's not read a particular book um or it's very easy for a person who's read a particular book to feel that that book was worthless because he's already crossed that bridge he's reached the other side uh, but for somebody who's on the other side on the, on the the previous side that book might still be useful right so like i know a couple of books like self help books particularly get a lot of hate um saying oh this is you know a waste of your time uh but you know what maybe you were the person who read this um and that made you advance to reading let's say more complex um stuff today 
because you read that you know five years ago um, it's not fair for you to be to be sort of shitting on someone who's doing it now like let him go on his own journey let him cross that bridge um so that was the first thought i had where i was like okay you know this stuff might seem like child's play to somebody today uh, but if that person had to rewind his own life um, it might not have been the, the, the case back then um, that was one and then there was like a very meta thought i had which was just uh, like we live in a world of abundance right like we have all of our basic needs met we've got food we've got shelter etc at least most of us um, at least those of us on the internet trying to build things and the purpose of our lives right now or what we're trying to find is we're trying to find meaning meaning we're trying to feel good about ourselves we're trying to wake up and feel like we're doing something useful we're trying to you know in other words we're trying to optimize for our emotional states at any point of time and if reading a book um that is about say productivity um helps you feel productive or helps you feel good even if you don't act on it and you start say you don't end up being productive or you don't end up implementing what that book told you to implement if you felt good during the process of reading that book and then you just went and picked up another productivity book and you felt good again and you repeated this you know all the way for the rest of your life um until you died and you just felt great you had all of your needs taken care of by default because you had a day job or whatever um and in your free time you felt good because you read these books um you didn't have to go and start building stuff online if if you didn't want to um then there's nothing wrong with that like why wh- who am i to judge that this person's reading productivity porn and not doing anything like if he's feeling good let him feel good like maybe he's reading productivity porn and, and he's not doing anything but feeling good it's probably better than him say going out and you know drinking by himself by a river or something right? let him read his books like who cares like anyway we've we're not we're not at a point where you have to work we're at a point where we want to work or where we want to do things you don't have to do things for most of us yeah, yeah that's right Yeah it's uh it's, it's certainly like m- most of us I think is the important term because there will be people who have to of course but yeah. th- those those are not part of this conversation right that people Correct. who really have to work they're not thinking about oh should I read my productivity book no they yeah. they need a job they need to work i yeah. i very much agree with this i f- i found this such a compelling thought the idea that in a world of abundance just even considering or or simulating productivity is as good as productivity <laughs> at least in in certain under certain constraints i really enjoy it. enjoy the idea because what you what you've said effectively is an anti gatekeeping uh, argument that's kind of what you made right because you you shouldn't read you should work is also gatekeeping in a way it's like oh no don't read those books yeah better just you know bog down and and, and work 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 and close yourself yep. off to the potential revelation of that bridge that the book might actually take you it's kind of keeping yep. you where you are i am a very much i am a big fan of reading like i'm a, i'm a writer i kind of want people to read not for, for somewhat selfish reasons but also for for selfless reasons i want other people to help themselves in reading mm-hmm. that's kind of what what reading books is like and i love the idea of the bridge book that's something that i think i had conceptually in my mind but never put into words so thank you for giving me this this idea it's kind of crossing the chasm by just putting putting like literally a gigantic book over it right and then walking yeah, over yeah. the book Why to not? the other side that's that's such a cool idea and like keeping people away from books that should have been a blog post i i like that phrase as well well the the good thing is some people love blog posts and for them it probably there is a blog post out there summarizing the book and other people really need it slow and steady and for them yeah. the blog post would not have been enough for them the book needs to be the book right so yeah, there's sure. there are all kinds of gatekeeping arguments in in this you shouldn't <laughs> read but work so yeah. i'm glad you for sure. i mean to to, to sort of expand on the last point you've made like like very often i think okay this book should have been a blog post um but the fact that you spent 6 hours reading about the same idea over and over again even if it could have been shortened um has meant that that idea has had more time to kind of you know percolate into your brain um so even if you feel like it was you know the same idea repeated you've given yourself more time to understand the idea or to kind of flirt with its you know um whatever its potential it's 100% that that's why i love books that are like really thematically focused on one idea and look at it from all different angles because if, I, if when i write about something in my own articles i try to look at it from at least two or three different perspectives so that anybody who has that perspective or that other perspective finds an accessible way into my my thinking into my thought into the idea that i want to convey because i know that we are living in a very diverse world of many people from different backgrounds some things are just not going to resonate with certain kind 
kind of people. But if I give myself the space and time to look at it from all these different angles, I can make it easier for people to absorb the knowledge, right? A blog post yeah. will always be opinionated. That's the kind of idea of a blog to begin with. But a book doesn't have to be. A book can be quite accessible. So in, in fact, it's about accessibility. Yeah, I mean, maybe in the future, you know, like just thinking out loud, like we might have, um, you know, AI versions of books, not AI versions, yes. but like personalized us, versions of right? books, right? Like, yeah, for instance, I love that. if you have five angles that you want to, you you want to kind of cover for each of the five different types of people, um, maybe you buy a book on your Kindle and the Kindle knows what angle you deserve to read from or what angle is, is best suited to you. Um, and it just serves you that angle. It doesn't serve you the other four. Um, and it serves someone else differently as well. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. But, yeah. but I mean, if, if there's any that? technology that might make this happen, that's the one you're currently working with, right? That's that's what GPT four and and all yeah. these things are doing. They are yep. like contextually rephrasing things to sound differently, but still say the same thing. That is what this yep. stuff is really good at. Man, I'm I'm so I'm so excited about the the world of like generative AI and the tools that have come through it. Like audio pen is a great example of this. It's uh, to me, uh, just a, a really small, tiny little step on top of existing steps, but into the absolute right direction. And they're making, making things easier and making things more accessible. I think accessibility, that's also an important part. Um, it, taking audio and converting it into text where people who can't write well or who don't enjoy writing can still write because what yep. you're doing is effectively you're allowing me to write with my voice. That's what, right. what audio pen is. And this is not an advertising for audio pen, although it might just as well be because it's a good product and I use it. Uh, my affiliate link will be <laughs> down below. But no, what, I, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is it is, it is so empowering that the, the thing that you build in this half day, uh, hackathon is, is opening up writing to people who are not necessarily primarily good writers. That yeah, is what I this mean, technology I, can I, do. I, I love this again through my dad, like he is exactly what you described. Like he's a very deep thinker, but English is not his primary language. So he would always write, like he would always, you know, type on his, his Google keep and send us these long essays, uh, but they would always not be very well framed, right? Like there would be typos, there would be, you know, grammatical errors here and there. Uh, and he would still sh like share it. He would share it, you know, maybe within the family because it's like a smaller group. Uh, now with audio pen, he just talks to his phone. He gets what he wants. Um, and he's more confident to be able to share that with anybody because it's grammatically correct. It's well-structured. Um, it's easy to read um, and just ready to share from like, you know, the get-go. Um, so he's probably like power user number one on the list of users <laughs> at the moment uh, where like every time he's, every day he, he creates a note and like shares it with everyone. Well, he must but be yeah, quite was, proud of you for that. Like that's that's yeah, one I mean, of the best the gifts tools, yeah. gifts you could give, right? <laughs> yeah, accidental again, but like great, great, yeah, tool, right? great, great concept. I, I guess you'll take it. No, the the cool <laughs> thing about AudioPen, let, let let me let me throw this one in is is uh, the the translation stuff as well. Like you can you can talk to it in any language you want, which is hopefully your your native tongue. And the thing that comes out of it can be in in any language that you like, which is that's also what an empowering move this is. Now all of a sudden you're turning this into a globally a global communication tool it's kind of like the the communicator in star trek that's what you're doing like you know the, yeah, the, the I mean, communicator between i mean races, i'm, I'm just doing. facilitating it like gpt4 and and open ai is help, like doing most of the the work but like yeah i'm glad to facilitate that i'm glad to be a channel for people to be able to um, and it's i mean it's it's great it's great to be building something that like people use that way and like it impacts them like you know forget the money but like when when i get like a user telling me hey you know you changed my life because of this i'm like oh my god that's that's crazy that's crazy to hear um, yeah, my, yeah. My, my example here, and I, I hope this story is, is something that you like. I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was in a, just in a thinky mood and I just wanted to write, but I didn't want to write. You know what I mean? So I, I just, I, I think I, I, uh, dictated five, 10, 15 minutes, uh, ideas into audio pen and I had, I had five articles done. Like I, I, I took the transcripts, I put them into my notion document where I had it. And like within just a couple hours, not even, I think like what, three hours, two hours. It, it was super, super quick. I had to, a month's worth of writing work, mostly done. And that was so cool yeah. knowing that, oh, no, now I can focus on all the other things I want to do. I don't need to sit yeah. down for like four days. I, I have done this in a couple hours. That was such an, such an amazing thing that I feel I still underpaid for the product. Let me, let me just say this, but you know, it's, it's so, so worth it to have a tool like this. I'm, I'm I, excited. You know, for, I'm still, I, I've not spoken about this to people before, but like I'm still slightly um, conflicted about 
whether making it easier for people to think and to write whether it's a good thing on the whole like for instance writing <laughs> is difficult work right like should people wrestle their thoughts um in order to get them out on the on paper should they be fighting that blinking cursor on a blank screen um for their thoughts to you know for their for their own whatever structure of their their thoughts to be to be improved um or should it be easy for them to do it like you know it almost feels like a cheat code like you talk to yeah. a, a phone or your computer and it creates this stuff for you um yeah i don't know like i'm but, still i'm still conflicted about whether it's you know a net positive. i think th- one hundred percent. I very much understand. I think from a from a like social philosophy standpoint, you could argue that every kind of technology has this problem that the typewriter was effectively a cheat code to writing because you you could argue that the hand eye coordination of long form writing also creates different thinking and different sentence structures and different you know different texts than if you were just typing it or or mm-hmm. if you were doing it on a computer with like. Uh, automatic suggestions of, of words or gr- grammar correction, grammarly, that kind of stuff, all the tools that have come up. I think every technology has the potential to be a cheat in the sense of that it mm-hmm. makes something that has a certain connection to your brain slightly different. And I agree yeah. with you. I think this in particular just kind of skips the writing part all, all in itself. But maybe mm-hmm. its purpose is not to be a replacement for writing. That's kind of what, what most AI tools um, are misunderstood at as are as replacements. I, th- I don't think they are. I think they're augmentations to the process. Like in, m- in my process as a writer, I use your tool or any kind of chat GPT based tool, not as a, a final product generator. I use it as a brainstorming tool. I use it for the first step that I would do anyway in the way I do it by dictating and then taking a transcript and then writing out particular parts of it or taking particular parts of that thing and turning them into bullet points or whatever. Your tool just facilitates that more easily. And I still write the article from there I'm, I'm not done once i've dictated this yeah. into into audio pen i'm just getting a much better interim result from which to write even better text so i think the moment we take the notion of tools replacing processes and just look into how, how tools augment processes i think this becomes less of a of a problem because you're not replacing writing and you're definitely not replacing thinking because thinking still needs to happen in the process yeah. of you know people talking into their microphones, it's just a different kind of thinking that happens. It's a more fluent one. It's less of a wrestling to type, you know, where, where the, the actual mm-hmm. act of typing comes comes in. It's a it's a more free version of thinking. It's different, and I think that's all right. Yeah. You're offering a different way of thinking. I, I kind of like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad you you think that way. Uh, yeah, it makes me feel better <laughs> as well, uh, because ultimately, <laughs> I want to make sure that. I mean, I want to be creating a net positive impact right like yeah. so yeah oh, i mean I i'm glad you are. feel that way um yeah i i, I, don't I, think I definitely are stop writing <laughs> you know? yeah, i mean I, I definitely still want to like build out like some of the features i was mentioning that i you know i'm thinking of like some of the directions i'm thinking of um i still want to push people to to use this as a first draft where they can then you know edit it within audio pen as well and then maybe even share it um so for instance like the focus mode for writing where you go into like a full screen mode that's like very minimal and sleek um, I want people to use that to kind of take that first, you know, draft that they get and then physically sort of sit down and and think through it. Um, and let's see, maybe I can nudge people in other ways as well to to use this as a starting point and, you know, as you said, kind of take it from there. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to be an interesting journey to watch where this product is going. And let's maybe uh, close it up right here. Um, where do people go to follow that journey, follow your products, your thinking, and your cool features that AudioPen will get in the future? Where do you want people to go? I mean, Twitter is the best place. I have I have a website as well, but but I would just say Twitter. Um, I'm just at my full name, um, Luis Parada. No spaces, no, no dots, no numbers. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm, I'm fairly active. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you certainly are. And I hope you stay that way. Um, I really, really enjoyed our conversation here today. I'm going to put all of this in the show notes, all your projects, all your, your Twitter handle and even your website, which I think is cool. It's cool that you have one way to just share all the things you've done in the past as well, because that's important for other people to see too. Man, Luis, thanks so much for being here today and talking to me about your, uh, blazing success story and your humble perspective on how this came to be. That was really, really interesting to hear. I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. And I'm really, really excited for the future of your indie hacking journey and your products. Thank you so much for being on the show today. 
Thanks for having me, man. Like it's been a it's been a pleasure. Um, I didn't think I would be talking to you. Um, you know, if you were to tell me like a few months ago, um, yeah, it's just it's just a it's 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 great to actually be able to speak to you. I'm very very grateful for it. Um, so thanks for the opportunity. Oh, uh, I, I feel the exact same way. Thanks so much. And that's it for today. Products like AudioPen are incredibly sellable, right? They're small scope. They don't need that many employees, if any at all. They're completely digital and everything is automated. Let's be honest, most indie hackers want things to stay that way. They don't want to hire or build multi-year sales processes. And often that causes things to slow down. Now, imagine this. Your founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired all your customers and you have generated just consistent monthly recurring revenue. Things are looking good, but the only problem is you're not growing for whatever reason. Lack of focus, lack of skill, or just plain lack of interest, you feel stuck. You might not even know where to go next because it would change the way that you run the business. It would change your lifestyle business and you don't know what to do. Well, the story that I would like to hear at this point is that you buckled down and somehow reignited the fire. You got past yourself and your limitations and the cliches, and you start working on the business rather than just in the business. And you start building this audience and move out of your comfort zone, do sales and marketing, all these things that six months down the road have tripled your revenue. Wouldn't that be great? Well, reality is not that simple. And this situation is different for every founder that is facing this particular crossroad. Too many times, though, this story ends up being one of inaction and often stagnation until the business becomes less valuable or even worse, worthless. And if you find yourself here or your story is likely headed down a similar road, I offer you a third option. Consider selling your business on acquire.com at this point, because this is really about your time, right? You capitalizing on the value of your time is a pretty smart move and acquire.com will help you with that. It's free to list and they've helped hundreds of founders already. So go to try.acquire.com slash Arvid and just see for yourself if this is the right option for you right now. Thank you for listening to the Bootser Founder today. You can find me on Twitter at Avid Kahl, A-R-V-I-D-K-A-H-L, provided that Twitter is still around when <laughs> you listen to this. And you'll find my books and my Twitter course there too. And if you want to support me in the show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, get the podcast in your player of choice, and leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. This really, really helps to show. Any of this really helps to show. So thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.